Hello and welcome to the CET 2B and MPhil ACE module on Rheology and Processing. This short introduction is designed to introduce to you the subject of rheology. What is it? It's not a term that is used on an everyday basis. I'd also like to give you some motivation for studying this fascinating subject because it does impact things that you use every day and that you see in nature every day. So I'd like to give you an outline of this course and where this course fits into courses that you may have already taken. I'd like to introduce the format of the lectures and also to give you an outline of the learning objectives. So let's start by considering the definition of rheology. Here on my blackboard I've put a short definition for you. Rheology is a branch of science that deals with the deformation and flow of matter, especially the non-Newtonian flow of liquids and the plastic flow of solids. Rheology is a division of the broader field of hydrodynamics. So, in short, rheology is the fluid mechanics of non-Newtonian liquids. And by non-Newtonian we could mean generalised Newtonian, shear thinning, shear thickening. We could mean viscoelastic, where viscosity and elasticity are effects, or viscoplastic, where viscosity and plasticity are key effects. Now, the term rheology has been in use for almost 100 years. It was coined in 1929 by Edward Bingham, and Edward Bingham is a name that we'll come across later on in this course. And up until that point, the subject that we now know as rheology was simply referred to as the science of deformation of matter, which isn't particularly succinct. And so in 1929, the term rheology was coined as the most appropriate designation for this subject. Before we go any further, let's examine some rheologically interesting materials that you might be familiar with. So, here on my blackboard, I have a picture of some cans of paint. Some of you may have tried painting things in the past with varying degrees of success, but in order for paint to be effective, it needs to display different material properties depending on what we're doing. So, if we think about when we're dunking a paintbrush into a paint pot, we want the paint to flow into the bristles of the brush. Likewise, when we get our paintbrush and apply the paint to a surface, we want the paint to flow off the bristles of the brush. Conversely, when the paint is on that surface, we don't want it to flow off that surface and sag. And so thinking about the simple process of painting makes us realise that the paint needs to exhibit different viscosities depending on the rate of deformation. So when we put the paintbrush into the paint pot, the rate of deformation is quite high. And so we want the viscosity to be low and for the paint to flow into the bristles. You can apply a similar argument for when you're painting a surface. Again, the rate of deformation is high. We want the viscosity to be low such that the paint can easily flow onto that surface. However, when the paint is on the surface, there is no deformation being applied and we want the paint to stay there. So we want it to exhibit a very high viscosity or perhaps we even want it to behave in a solid-like manner. And so we have this shear thinning behaviour or viscoplastic behaviour that makes paint what it is. Without it, if paint was a Newtonian liquid, it wouldn't work. So let's think of another material. Let's think about your cup that you drink tea or coffee or water out of. If it's a china cup, then let's think about how it was made. In the olden days, you'd get a spinning wheel, you would get some clay, some wet clay, and as the clay turned on the wheel, you would shape form the clay. And in effect, the clay would flow as you apply stress to shape form it. As soon as you stop applying stress and you take your hands away from the clay, the material stays in the shape that you've just formed and doesn't sag. So clays exhibit plasticity. They are viscoplastic materials. When there's no stress applied, they don't flow. When you apply stress, they do flow. If you're camping and your mug was not ceramic but it was plastic, a polymer, for example polypropylene, let's think about how that's made. Polypropylene is an engineering thermoplastic. It's got lots and lots of polymer chains that, when molten, are free to move and also free to rotate and stretch and store stress and then release stress. And so when we injection mould or extrude something like polypropylene, we see lots of behaviour that we might not expect. If you extrude polypropylene, the shape of the product that you make doesn't resemble the shape you squeezed it out of. Polypropylene is an intensely viscoelastic material. 
it displays both viscosity and elasticity. The elasticity stores stress, which drives fluid deformation after you've stopped applying external stress. And so polypropylene can flow in very unexpected ways. On the subject of breakfast still, let's think about your breakfast cereal. You might, for example, like eating these little shapes in a bowl of milk. And these little shapes are quite simple. They're simply cylinders with holes in the middle. And if we want to shape form a cylinder with a hole in the middle, it's typically done by extrusion. Imagine squeezing toothpaste on your windowsill. That's extrusion. You're extruding the toothpaste out of the tube. And the similar process allows these industrial products to be made. But if we want that shape of your breakfast cereal to be a very specific shape, then we need to understand how the material behaves throughout the entire extrusion process. Your breakfast cereal will be typically what's known as a thermoelastic starch, and these thermoplastic starches tend to be very viscoelastic, which means that the final shape you get post-extrusion doesn't resemble your extrusion die shape at all. And so we need to understand how that shape change works. If we're thinking again about not breakfast cereal but precision extrusions where the shape is very very important, it's even more important that we know how viscoelastic materials behave as a function of shear rate and as a function of time. Let's think about one final example, inkjet printing. Inkjet printers such as this large format printer here require nice clean paper to produce nice sharp images. Let's think about the concept of a sharp image. As ink is sprayed out of the nozzles in an inkjet printer, we want that ink to just be a single droplet, a single small droplet. We don't want that droplet in flight to break up and form lots of tiny droplets, which would not give a nice clear crisp image, but it would give a blurry fuzzy image. The control of droplet breakup behavior is entirely influenced by the rheology of the ink. And so ink rheology is hugely important in enabling clear, crisp printing. There's many, many, many other examples I could give. Many examples out in nature of how slugs move and perhaps how certain carnivorous plants behave that also involve interesting rheological fluids. But I've only got a short time here to explain things. Now, one of the things about rheologically interesting materials is that they can flow in unexpected ways. Consider the following. Some liquids can actually flow against gravity and self-pour. I'll give you an example of this in section B of this course, but consider for a moment that you're a chemical engineer designing a holding tank that holds a viscoelastic solution. It's got an overflow just in case you overfill it, and imagine that you accidentally do slightly overfill the tank and you get a little bit of material going out of the overflow. For materials that self-pour, you might end up inadvertently emptying the entire tank, which is a little bit embarrassing. So we need to understand this behavior. Some materials can behave like elastic solids in some states of stress and then behave like viscous liquids in others. Clay is an example of this. You have an elastic solid when the yield stress has not been reached. And then you have a viscous liquid as you shape form, a very thick, viscous, highly viscous, viscous liquid. We also see materials where liquid viscosities change with deformation rate, paint, for example, but also change with time. And so the restoration of an original viscosity can take quite some time. And that's an example of a thixotropic material. Materials can also distort unrecognizably during shape forming, and extrusion is a very good shape forming process, and we, we need to understand that. And the final thing that might come as a complete shock to you is that viscoelastic liquids can exhibit chaotic turbulence at vanishingly small Reynolds number, and all this is down to elastic effects, not inertial effects. And so, as engineers and as scientists, we really need to understand rheology to understand this wide and fascinating range of flow phenomena. Let's think about how rheology fits into professional engineering practice. There's two broad branches we can divide the subject into. Firstly, you might be interested in materials processing. You might be interested in extrusion shape forming or injection molding, for example. This is actually the route that I came into rheology by. I was doing a lot of work on 
in the um, extrusion of thermoplastics and trying to make very precise shapes which meant that I needed to understand how the materials I was using behaved under deformation and post-deformation. And so I needed to know information about the material and modelling was also involved at that point to try and understand the process better. This leads to more process innovation and leads to scientific and engineering understanding and all of this allows you to affect and to improve the quality of a manufactured product. This branch doesn't stand on its own though because, as I said, I needed to understand the material I was using. And so there's another branch of rheology that looks at the experimental characterization of non-Newtonian fluids out of sheer interest and to try and describe their material response as a function of deformation rate to form what we know as constitutive equations. You can then use these constitutive equations in modeling processes to try and understand how processes behave from first principles. So, if you're interested in practical manufacturing and experimentation, whether you're interested in theory and especially mathematical fluid mechanics theory, or if you're interested in a bit of both, then rheology is a very broad-based subject that will appeal to you. So let's think about how rheology fits into the fluid mechanics that you might already know. So on my blackboard here, I'm putting a kind of graph. I'm looking as a function of Reynolds number on the x-axis at two different classes of material, Newtonian fluids and non-Newtonian fluids. Let's recap Newtonian fluids first. At low Reynolds number, you've got creeping flow. You can use the Navier-Stokes equation to find some simple analytical solutions for simple flow scenarios in simple geometries. And you can solve the Navier-Stokes equations numerically for engineering geometries. If we're looking at high Reynolds number, then you have turbulent flow, inertially dominated flow. And you've had a look at some theory for inertially dominated flow. And the direct numerical simulation of these turbulent flows is becoming more commonplace. So we have turbulence models such as Reynolds average Navier-Stokes or large eddy simulation in order to get a computation of how a fluid behaves in a turbulent manner. So if we think of these two broad ranges of Reynolds number, let's have a look at non-Newtonian fluids. Now, for the low Reynolds number range, you can get some analytical solutions for some simple geometries and some simple rheologies. You can also get numerical solutions for complex geometries and complex rheologies, although some of these numerical solutions are challenging due to, for example, the presence of elastic turbulence. If we are in high Reynolds number, where we have inertia also present, then this is still a very challenging research field. And if you want to take rheology further, this is a good thing to get involved in. So the focus of this course really is on those analytical solutions for simple geometries and simple rheologies at fairly low Reynolds number. So let's go on to give you an overview of this course. This course is divided into four sections. So the first section is all around key concepts. I'm going to introduce to you some revision, some stress and strain revision. We're going to have a look at constitutive equations. We're going to remind ourselves of the Newtonian constitutive equation and for specific solutions to the Newtonian constitutive equation, couette flow and pipe flow. We're then going to look at some measurement techniques that rheologists commonly use to try and characterize unknown materials. The second part of this course, we're going to examine viscoelastic materials. I'll give you an introduction as to what viscoelasticity is and how we model it, and I'm going to introduce to you a model called the Maxwell model. This Maxwell model we will examine in quite a lot of depth. We will look at it in different mathematical formulations, differential form and integral form. We will also see how we make the Maxwell model fit real materials, and there's quite a lot of subtlety here as to how that is done. We'll then have, have a look at some of the more advanced ways in which we can describe general flow behaviour of viscoelastic liquids. Now, section three of this course deals with viscoplasticity. Again, I'm going to introduce to you what viscoplasticity is and the Bingham, Herschel Bulkley and Casson fluids and how some of these fluids flow in pipes. We're going to look at how we calculate pressure drops of viscoplastic fluids and we're also going to look at certain flow scenarios again. We're going to look at pipe flow and couette flow because these are common measurement techniques. But we will see that viscoplastic fluids exhibit different behaviours or compound behaviours in the one device depending on the deformation rate. 
We're going to have a little look at some computational techniques, and these are called regularization techniques. And we're also going to examine the phenomenon of the wall slip boundary condition. The final part of this course will look at multiphase materials. We're going to have a look at how, when you put sometimes two Newtonian fluids together, they behave in a non Newtonian fashion. We're going to introduce the concept of thixotropy to you, and we're going to introduce a model that explains thixotropy. We're going to have a look at suspensions, and we're going to have a look at emulsions. So, hopefully, that you'll find this a very, very interesting course. Now, the way this course is organised is as follows. Each lecture typically will be in three parts. There's one lecture that's in four parts, just because there was some material there I didn't want to rush through. Each of these parts contains a particular topic or subtopic, and videos of these lectures will be put on YouTube with links from Moodle. So lecture notes for each section will be made available at the start of each section of the course, as will relevant examples papers. There's going to be one examples paper for section A, one examples paper for section B, and then one examples paper that covers both of the final two parts of the course, section C and section D. Now, in terms of course aims, broadly, by the end of this course, you should understand what rheological classification is, you should understand methods of making rheological measurements, you should understand the basics of viscoelasticity and viscoplasticity, and you should understand the flow behaviour of suspensions and emulsions. Now, one final word, this course isn't all my own work, and the course at the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology has been in existence for many, many years. I'd like to acknowledge in particular Professor Malcolm Mackley, who is the original author of this course, and who put together all the material that myself and my co-lecturer, Professor Ian Wilson, inherited a number of years ago. Professor Ian Wilson and myself took Professor Mackley's material and added to it and changed a few things around, and so I'd like to also acknowledge the work of Ian in this course, who was my co-lecturer for sections C and D until very recently. I'd also like to acknowledge Dr Andrew Howe, who worked with Professor Wilson as a contributor to sections C and D. So, there's the course introduction. I do hope you consider studying this course, and if you do, I really hope you enjoy it.